Let's continue with limits. In a previous video, you were given a brief glimpse into where limits would take us in the very near future in calculus. That was a discussion involving secant lines and secant slopes, and how if you take the limit of a secant slope, that's what gives you a tangent slope. Uh, there was then another video that got into looking at limits graphically. And certainly, if you have any questions remaining from uh, from that look at limits, you should address those questions in office hours. But this video is on looking at limits numerically. And we'll, we'll hint at the graphical and algebraic aspects of it. I, I don't want you to think of these three viewpoints, the graphical, numerical, and algebraic viewpoints of limits as separate and independent from each other. They're, they're all meant to reinforce each other. But we'll primarily be looking at limits numerically today. And this is what a numerical exercise in limits might look like. Uh, you'll be given a, a, an expression, a limit expression, and sometimes the, the thing you're taking the limit of can be a little bit ugly, a little bit daunting. But you'll be asked to complete, in this case, the table using the, the result of the table to estimate the value of the limit. And what should jump out at you is that we're taking the limit as x approaches 6, as x gets closer and closer to 6. And since there's neither a plus or a minus up here, superscripted next to the 6, that means we'll look from both directions. What should also jump out at you is that in the table itself, notice that the number 6 is, is absent. We're dancing all around the number 6, but 6 itself is not present in the table. And if you look algebraically at the expression up here, I hope it's apparent why 6 is not present in the table. Can you see what the problem with plugging 6 into that expression is? I imagine that when you look at the denominator, you immediately see what's wrong with 6. But I'd also ask you to, to pause for a moment and, and uh, ask what happens when you plug 6 into this numerator here. Sometimes direct substitution is the way to go. Direct substitution is the act of just taking this number that you're supposed to be approaching and just plugging it into the overall expression. And sometimes if that gives you a, a real result, that will be your answer. But in this case, we got 0 over 0, right? Plugging 6 into the denominator gave us 0, and plugging 6 into the numerator also gave us 0. And while you may be inclined to say, oh, that's undefined, well, it is undefined, but it's a special kind of undefined. 0 over 0 is something that's called an indeterminate form. And I'm not going to dwell on that, that vocabulary too much right now, but I will say that very shortly you will need to know what that means. So I, I would suggest you write that down. And, and we'll discuss more later what all the implications of that are. In short, all I'll say about it right now is that when you get 0 over 0 in a limit problem, think of that as meaning your work is not done. That is not a final answer. You should not stop. You need to kind of back up and find some other more clever way to come up with what the actual value of the limit is. I also want to point out that 0 over 0 should remind you of something that we studied earlier in the year. That should seem a little bit familiar when we were striving to understand discontinuities in functions and what leads to vertical asymptotes versus holes. If you recall those studies, you'll remember that what those mean is that this graph, whatever it may look like, if you were to graph this function on your calculator, you would get some sort of continuous curve that's continuous everywhere except the 0 over 0 that we experienced when we plugged in 6 means that there is going to be a hole at x equals 6. So again, that, that explains why we will dance all around the number 6 in our table, but we will not have 6 itself in the table. So let's go ahead and grab our calculators and enter that function, that entire expression, into the calculator. And I would encourage you to pause the video, grab your calculator, and follow along here. This is one of those times where if you have one of the newer calculators that allows you to enter those fraction bars, those horizontal fraction bars as they appear, you'll be glad that you have that feature. Uh, if you have an older calculator, it can be done. You can enter this function in, of course. Here I've switched the calculator to mimic one of those older style calculators, and uh, you'll notice that again, with parentheses within parentheses, you can get that fraction in there. Just takes a little more effort and diligence to make sure that you get all the parentheses right. But let me go back to the, to the newer model calculator. And if I go ahead and graph this, if I start out by zo using Zoom Standard, Zoom 6, we'll see 
uh, curve. Uh, we won't see the hole though. Um, I, have, I have my calculator set so that it, we understand by now that vertically there is an asymptote. Uh, there's not really a kind of almost vertical line on the, on the true graph. Um, I don't see a hole at 6 though. And you'll recall that sometimes, many times, if not most of the time, our calculator won't display the hole. I can trace to 6 and verify that there is no uh, y value in x is 6. And if uh, it's really important to me to see that hole, I might try zoom decimal. That often does the trick. Zoom number 4. Of course, all these calculator commands I'm talking about are TI specific. Sorry if you're using a different model calculator. And just barely on the screen there, I could see at x equals 6, I do see the, the calculator displaying a hole there. If I, if I want to center that a little more, if I go to the window settings, um, if, if I increase that x min by, let's say I increase that x min by 6, so I make this negative 0.6, and then I also increase the x max by 6, making this 12.6, as long as the total interval, the x interval, is maintained, uh, I should still be able to see the hole. There we go. So I see more clearly there at x equals 6, uh, the hole is displayed. And if I want, I can go ahead and start tracing to the values in the table and filling in that table. I can trace to x equals 5.9. In fact, let me go ahead and do that. 5.9. And I see my y value there, and I can fill that in the table and proceed to plug in the, the um, trace to the other x values. And by the way, notice that I, uh, in filling in the table, I did more than the usual three decimal places that's standard on an AP exam. I usually do four or, or more often five. Um, you'll probably see why in a moment here. But let me uh, show you another approach that you can choose to use in filling in a table. You know you can go to second table on the TI calculators, and depending on your table settings, you'll see something like what you see on the screen here. But I wanna, I wanna change one more thing on the table settings that you may have not ever bothered to, to play with before. Let's go to second window, second table set, and let's go down to independent variable, and instead of leaving it on auto, let's change it to ask. And now when I go to second table, you'll see that there are no x values. It has not automatically filled in the x values, and therefore there are no automatically filled in y values. It's asking me, it, it wants me to tell, what, uh, tell the calculator what x values to put in. So, I can now type in 5.9 and hit enter, and I see the same y value that I saw earlier when I traced. And if you're wondering why do I only see, or, or how can I get to see more than the four decimal places that, it display, that it's displaying right now, I can uh, arrow over and see down there that it will display underneath the table, it will display more decimal places, more digits. But let me go back to the x column. And now let me plug in 5.99. And I see another y value. Let's plug in 5.999. There's another one. And again, since I'm going to choose to, to fill in my table to five decimal places, let me arrow over here and display the longer version of those values. All right, there's the the x equals 5.999 corresponding y value. Let's fill in the rest of them here. 6.001, 6.01, and 6.1. I'm getting further away from that hole here, and those corresponding y values, negative 0.88830, negative 0.88300, and negative 0.83333. Okay, the calculator's done its part. Let's put that away for a moment. Let's emphasize this again, that even though earlier plugging in six exactly gave us zero over zero result, we clearly see that we're approaching some number. And if you're really observant, you even kind of notice a pattern here. Um, notice that at the x equals 6.1 y value, we had a single 8 followed by some 3s. And then when we plugged in 6.01, we had two 8s, or 0.88, followed by uh, 3. And then when we plugged in 6.001, we had negative 0.888, three 8s, followed by a 3. Uh, of course, there's nothing to stop you from plugging in 6.0001 or 6.00001. And I encourage you to, to do that and confirm that that pattern does, in fact, continue. 
Do be aware, of course, that your calculator, as you know, has its limitations. Let's say I just went nuts and plugged in a whole bunch, 12 or 13 zeros, followed by a 1. At some point, the calculator just goes, all right, I'm just going to treat that as if it were 6 exactly and give you an error. By the way, if you want to, when you're in this mode of the table, if you want to get rid of one of those rows, you can just use this delete key and delete any row you want. And do remember that when you're done with this kind of exercise, remember to go back to second table set and change that, uh, that setting back from ask, change it back to auto if that's what you would prefer to have as your default. All right, but let's go ahead and make a conclusion here about what this uh, limit is equal to. The limit of this crazy function. And if you're, um, by the way, one thing that uh, it's a bit of a peeve of mine and, and many math teachers is don't just write lim equals. You've got to write something there. You've got to take the limit of something. Um, writing lim without plugging anything into the limit, that's sort of like saying square root equals and then writing some number over here. It doesn't make any sense if you don't have any expression underneath the, the square root symbol, right? So similarly, it doesn't make sense if you don't write an expression next to the limit. However, I'll make this concession to you. If you're feeling lazy and don't feel like writing this, this uh, entire crazy expression again, as long as you clearly label it and say, I'm going to call that f of x. If you clearly label it and say, I'm going to refer to that as f of x, then we can put f of x next to the limit, followed by an equal sign. And I will admit the book, um, our textbook, kind of already implies that by labeling f of x in the table here. They're already kind of implying that we are thinking of this function as f of x. And we should acknowledge we're making a bit of an assumption here. If we were to put negative 0 0.0, 888, or if you want, negative 0.8 repeating. If you want to speculate that that is a repeating decimal, I'll go ahead and confirm for you that's correct. And on a later date, when we tackle this algebraically, we will confirm and prove beyond any doubt that that is correct. And knowing what that is as a fraction, I'd say when it is a recognizable fraction, negative 0.888 repeating, we should know that is negative 8 ninths. So please do go ahead and write it as an improper fraction when it is apparent what that number is. Okay, so don't forget this last step. I do find over the years that quite often students fill in the table, but then forget to write this final step, what the limit actually equals. That is your answer. But before we uh, call it done, let's look at this a little bit more and see how does this fit into the bigger picture of calculus. When we look at that giant expression, doesn't it look strikingly similar to a uh, rise over run? What if we thought of this numerator as a y2 minus y1? And what if we thought of the denominator as a x2 minus an x1? Isn't that the kind of calculation we do when we're calculating a slope? And in fact, if you were to just graph this expression up here, this y expression, on your calculator, uh, notice that if you were then to trace to x equals 6, you get y equals 4 thirds. And isn't that the, the 6 and the 4 thirds that we see here? Those are clues that I don't expect you to uh, completely grasp all the implications at this point, but, but I hope it kind of makes sense that what we're seeing here is evidence that we're not just calculating any limit here, we're calculating a derivative, we're calculating a rise over run, we're calculating a secant slope, and by taking the limit of that secant slope, this entire expression is actually giving us a tangent slope. So we didn't have to have that, that knowledge ahead of time in order to numerically evaluate the limit with the help of our calculators, with the help of technology. But now that we look at it, recognize that that negative 8 ninths that we got there was a tangent slope of this 4 over 2x minus 9 function at x equals 6. That's the same as saying that negative 8 ninths is the derivative of f of x at x equals 6. And that's the same, we, we, another notation for saying that, is that all of that is equal to f prime of 6. Okay, so I'm getting a little ahead of things. I'm, again, trying to preview some notation that we'll need to become comfortable with in the very near future. But for right now, I, I want to emphasize too that you're not always going to see this rise over run structure in every single limit you do, but when you do see something that looks like it could be a y2 minus a y1 over an x2 minus an x1, consider that that's probably a derivative. And last thing I'll do on this slide is show the tangent line at x equals 6. 
and stress one last time that the slope of that tangent line at x equals 6 is negative 8 ninths. Okay, uh, again, I think you'll find this, this type of numerical activity pretty straightforward. I'm just asking you to give it a little extra thought as to why we might be doing something like this. And last point I'll make before I wrap up this video is to say that sometimes, here's, here's another example um, already completed, and sometimes you'll find that the result is not an obvious fraction. Whereas on the example we did, we got negative 0.8 repeating, and we knew that was negative 8 ninths. In this case, you're getting some number that's about 1.4815, and, and you may not even be sure whether you should uh, have that last digit be a 4 or a 5 based on these two values in the table. So I would accept either one. Um, I will go ahead and tell you that in this case, because I've worked through it algebraically, I did find that that fraction is equal to 40 over 27. But I will acknowledge that that is not obvious at all. And in such cases, just go ahead and put, a, um, just go ahead and put the decimal approximation to at least three or four or five decimal places. Um, sometimes, to be honest, that uh, final result is not even a rational number. Sometimes you will get radicals, irrational numbers in your final answer when we ultimately do this uh, algebraically. All right, that's all I got for now. Uh, come to office hours if any of it didn't make sense, please.